In war-torn Afghanistan, women struggle to provide for their families in this deeply patriarchal society. Homebound, with limited or no education, and often widowed, these women have few opportunities for employment. Today's guest, Rangina Hamidi, returned to Afghanistan after 9-11 to help rebuild her native Kandahar. Through the revival of Kamak embroidery, Rangina started Kandahar Treasure as a way for women to generate income, gain financial independence, and restore pride in this artistic tradition. Rangina has worked hard for better education and the justice that surrounds it. She served as the Afghani education minister from 2020 until the Taliban took control of the government in 2021. She is the recipient of the 2024 O'Connor Justice Prize, which recognizes people who have made extraordinary contributions to advancing the rule of law, justice, and human rights. So you know this is gonna be a good one. So grab your sewing and a cup of tea, and here's my interview with Rangina Hamidi. So welcome, Rangina, to the show. Thank you so much. Whereabouts in the world are you coming to us from? Thank you, Karen. Thanks for having me. I am at the moment living in uh, Dubai, the city that most people in the world are aspiring to be in. <laughs> now, you're not originally from Dubai. Whereabouts? Sure. I'm originally from um, Afghanistan. I was born in Kandahar, but I didn't grow up in Afghanistan. I compare ourselves to when I was a, a child, about three to four years of age, and the Russia of today, which was called USSR um, in the past, invaded my country like they invaded Ukraine. And so I, I say to people today that we were the Ukraine of the early 80s. And so as a result of the communist coup taking place in my birth country of Afghanistan, my father, who refused to join the communist regime, had two choices, either be killed by the communists or flee. And so he chose to uh, take his wife, his widowed mother, his single sister, and his five little daughters out of the country to give them a second chance. So that's where I'm originally from, Afghanistan. After living in a refugee camp for so many years, you did end up going to the U.S. at one point, didn't you? We actually did not live in a refugee camp. My father uh, refused to live in a refugee camp. He said, I have two working hands and two working feet and a brain that still works, uh, even though he was a refugee, but he opted out to go and work for a private business to sustain his family. And later on, I learned that he had a political reason. He said, I did not want my children to be raised on rations from the world. I wanted them to know the value of working hard and ethically and principally. And so, yes, he made us survive as refugees in Pakistan for about six and a half years before our case was accepted um, under the UNHCR refugee program for Afghans to go to the U.S. And in 1988, we landed in Virginia, where we settled and became Afghan refugees living in America. And we initially thought that we were only going for about a year or two. And this past uh, February, we, as a family, we, we completed our 36 years in America. Your family valued education and especially education of girls. How did that affect your learning path? My father enrolled my little sister and I, two out of the five, and my older sisters complain now. Dad is no longer with us to ask him directly why he didn't enroll the elder uh, girls. But my assessment is that daddy couldn't afford to send five girls to private school um, in a country that he was learning to start life all from scratch again. Um, and so he enrolled the two little ones that he could because I think our fees were the cheapest. And we were little enough where he knew that socially it would not create problems in the community that he was living. Um, and when we, my sister and I, I was in third grade and she was in second grade, we were literally stopped from going to school uh, by the predecessors of the current regime. And at that time, we called them the freedom fighters that America funded, the Mujahideen. They did not think it was appropriate for girls to go to school. And that decision ultimately convinced my father that his girls would not have a future in the country of Pakistan, living, living as an Afghan refugee. And that convinced him to make the decision to come all the way to America to 
allow us the opportunity to become educated. And, and we did. We did the best that we could. What did you study at college? Initially, I was a pre-med student. That's what many refugee kids are encouraged to do, right? You go into medicine. It's a promising career. And I enjoyed biology. It's still one of my favorite subjects in life. But it was the second year of college that I took an elective. It was called Women's Studies 101. And I just took it as an elective because I was interested in, to learn what why there was a course on women's studies. And I just fell in love with the theory with the philosophies of what we were learning and the injustices that I began to learn through literary works and, you know, the history of feminism. And I started to take a second course, the second semester. And that then led me to be fascinated with religion because at the time that I was in college, 1996, till 2000 at the University of Virginia, the type of literature that is now available on the Muslim woman in the world uh, was not available at that time. Uh, literature was very biased in one way. The Muslim woman to me was represented in the literature as oppressed, quiet, controlled, immobile, somebody who's never able to make her own decisions and do anything on her own. And so the more I studied, the more I took these classes, the more I got involved in wanting to know more. And so one day I very uh, very vividly remember taking my mom and dad out for brunch on a weekend. And I said, would you disown me if I did not complete my pre-med course of work? And my dad just looked at, at me with, you know, astonishment in his eyes. He's like, well, what, what are you planning to do? And I said, well, I'm interested in religious studies and women's studies, and I have no idea what I want to do with it, but I, I don't want to spend more time on organic chemistry, you know, the, the science of boring classes. I said, I'm fascinated by learning more about the social aspect of Islam, the religion, comparative religion, and then women. And, and the Taliban were, you know, Taliban 1.0 was in power at that time. So I knew in the back of my head what was happening in my birth country as well. My mom didn't say anything. She said, whatever makes you happy. And dad looked at me. He's like, listen, I, it's your life you will live with this, with this decision for the rest of your life. But he said, I ask you one thing, go become, you know, a cleaner or, you know, whatever you decide to do, become a seamstress, become a designer, become whatever you choose to want to become. But I ask you that whatever field you choose, be the best at it. And so taking that and as, as the guiding principle of changing and switching my major really late second year of college, I just devoted myself to taking more classes, learning more about the religion, this very religion that, that was presented to me as the source of oppression for Muslim women. And graduating in 2000 with a double major in religious, comparative religion, as well as women's studies, but completely confused because I had no idea what to do with these two, <laughs> two lessons or two uh, subjects that I had learned. I wanted to go to Afghanistan, but I couldn't. I knew I couldn't. I did not know what options I had for graduate school. I just said, let me take a year off to work and figure out what it is that I want to do with my life and then decide. And then a little over a year after graduation, September 11th happened, Afghanistan happened, and then unplanned and asked for, I found myself in Kandahar, Afghanistan on February 1st, 2003, going to help the women of my country, not knowing how, but I was there because that's what I had made a commitment to. Had your family and yourself kept contacts with people that you knew in Afghanistan or were you jumping off the plane knowing no one? No, I um, my aunts actually still lived in Afghanistan. So my dad's sisters and their families lived there. You know, Afghanistan is not nuclear family structures, extended family structure. So even if I didn't know anybody, if I just mentioned my father or my mother's name, you know, within minutes, I would find some contact with somebody. Uh, so, yes, there was extended family living there, but my immediate family was not there when I went. Um, and that was an issue, actually, to consider and to ponder upon. But the support that my father provided as a Kandahari Pashtun man who trusted his daughter. And when I brought the subject up, Dad, how will people accept me, a single young Afghan-American woman to come and live and work with an, with an organization where her own family is not here? His response to me was, if you're going to worry about what people say, you might as well just give up on what you want to do. He supported me in so many other ways, but that was probably the, the foundation of 
what made me go and made me stay uh, for almost two de decades after. So where did you get the idea for Kandahar Treasure? When I first went to Kandahar, um, I joined an organiz a local organization that was working with women, women's income generation project. And I had, you know, had just graduated from college. I knew something about empowering women financially and that, you know, that financial independence is important, but practically I had no idea what that meant. And so I just wanted to go to Afghanistan so badly that I didn't care what I had to do. I just wanted to go. And so I went. But very quickly, I learned, you know, the, the fact that the international community was present in Afghanistan uh, with the U.S. leading uh, the efforts that it did and money pouring, literally money pouring like rain drops from the sky on anything particularly focused on Afghan women. So there were many, many organizations, donors who wanted to fund activities. And, and Kandahar was a place where not too many people traveled to because it was the de facto capital of the Taliban 1.0. It was a conservative region. And the focus was primarily in Kabul because that's the capital and that's where all the political activities was, was happening. But I chose to go to Kandahar because my language, my mother's tongue is from Kandahar. And I felt much more comfortable going to a region where I could speak the language rather than Kabul, where my daddy or Farsi at that time was not as strong. And so when I went, I was the manager for that particular women's income generation project. And we had funding from all these donors and they would require us to write reports, take pictures, tell them all the progress we were making. And I was doing that and a year passed and two years passed and nothing changed. And I was just getting bored with what am I doing? Nothing creative, nothing innovative and writing the same reports and oftentimes not lying about the reports, but the expectations of the donors was more than what we could do with the women in the community that we were working. First of all, the donor community was pushing to encourage women to come out of their homes, to come to a facility, a, a center and work. And we were constantly faced with problems with that because the majority of families did not allow their women to come out. And so when I pushed and I did succeed. I said, instead of asking the women, if the idea is to empower women financially, why does it make a difference whether we bring women out of the home or go and take the work to the women in their homes? I won the battle of saying, convincing the donors that it was okay to go to the homes. And that's what we did. And once we went to the homes, I realized that the women of Kandahar had this incredible skill of hand embroidering, one of the most finest the most intricate embroidery technique in the world. I mean, now I know, but at that time, I did not know that it was the most unique in the world. And they were good at it. We did not have to teach them. We did not have to waste any time having classes or training sessions for them to learn the skill. And so I quickly moved to this idea of why not utilize a skill that already exists, but help the women create a product that can then help them generate the income. And that in the time, you know, in the initial years when we were getting donor funding to support it, it was great. But in the back of my head, I was always aware of the fact that the donor community is not going to remain in Afghanistan forever. The time frame, of course, was hard to predict, but I knew that they were not going to be here forever. So how do you start thinking about the sustainability of a project or an entity uh, while utilizing that that time as as a foundation to build it. And so what I really did is, yes, I had to write the monthly reports, the quarterly reports for women to show how many women we had employed, how many women were generating the type of products that they were producing. But on the side, while the donors were not interested in the quality of the workmanship and the skill building, I use the time to push the agenda of quality control and quality enhancement. And there's a beautiful story of one time a woman had done a horrible job of her work. I mean, she just, the, the counting on the stitches were off and, you know, the design that I had initially asked her to create was not well done. And the rule was that we were not going to pay the women full price if they didn't produce the quality that we asked for. And so... She gave me the piece of work. I told her the work was not to the standards that I wanted. And so I gave her half the money, which was what the agreement was. And she started quarreling with me. She's like, who are you to take my money? And I said, 
that's the agreement. She's like, yeah, that might be agreement for these foreigners. If these foreigners don't care, because my boss was an American woman. And so she said, if the foreigners don't care, who are you to come here and care about quality? And I said, oh, is that the agreement, you know, the argument you're making with me? I said, you know, from now on, I'm going to be even more strict on pushing for quality control of the work because I know you're capable of doing good work. So I stood strong to my, you know, the 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 commitment that we were not going to pay full price if the work was not of quality. And one try, two try, three try, and by the third time they learned, they're like, okay, she's, she's strict, she's not gonna pay us. So they started producing the beauty that I was looking for. And again, I didn't have to train these women. They knew it, they were just not producing high enough quality because over the years that they've had to produce for various different funded projects, they had learned that they could get away with bad quality. So why produce something when people are willing to accept? And so I think the foundation of Kandahar Treasure was really that moment when we said quality over just busy work to keep women busy. And the quality meant than finding markets that would allow the women to sustain their work even beyond the donors. So what skills did you bring with your women's studies and what you you did at university? What skills were those that you brought to the project? I don't know if I brought any skills. Uh, I think I've learned myself the knowledge, you know, the, the, the academic knowledge that we were given through the books and the literature and the histories that we've learned about women's movements. Having received my degree from an American institution, obviously the focus was primarily on America. But later on, as I got engaged and learned and read more about the global women's movement, I've learned, and particularly with the work that the women of Kandahar Treasure have shown me, is that Context matters. Yes, there are some overlapping principles and and issues that women globally uh, face. So if we focus primarily on economic empowerment, economic empowerment is a necessary tool for women's rights and women's rights to be advanced and and put on you know, front agendas of, of many governments uh, and many uh, communities. But financial independence requires serious commitment not just by the individual who's trying to, you know, enhance her financial uh, situation, but also families and communities and governments. From a policy perspective, when women's issues is just a side symbolic, oh yeah, tag along, like, oh yeah, we're doing this government building and structure uh, based on principles of democracy and human rights. And then of course we take, you know, we, we worry about and we, care about women's issues as well, those things don't last. And and that's what I've learned with the women, and hopefully the women have learned that for 20 years, the international community's investment in Afghanistan was that when we treated women's issues as a tag along, as just side business, of course, we lost everything in seconds when the regime changed. But systematic, foundational uh, institution building which unfortunately did not happen across the country uh, for the 20 years of investment and you know billions of dollars invested in this cause. We learned that we, we lose things when, when the political shifts happen. And so the skills, I guess, that I would say that I've learned with the investment and working with Kandahar Treasure for more than two decades now is that when we work and invest in women's organizations or women's activities or women's um, enterprises, uh, first, we have to have a long-term vision. You cannot expect a society and a culture that has you know, thousands of years of baggage and patriarchy and traditions and conservatism and lack of education and lack of opportunities to all of a sudden commit to one or two years of the work and then expect the work, you know, the, the society to change overnight. That, that does not happen. And number two, when we make strategic plans for with a long-term vision for what it is that we want to do, uh, particularly with women's work, if you do it honestly, if you do it committedly and dedicatedly, I've also again proven to myself and the women have proven to me and to the world that regardless of the regime change, political regime change, when women are committed to something, that will sustain itself. And so Kandahar Treasure today, even almost three years after the second Taliban regime takeover, are still coming to work every day 
they're producing beautiful products that are, you know, we're making available to the global community for purchase. And they're sustaining themselves with this income that they're generating themselves. And the one proud moment that I have is when in, I believe it was December of 2021. So a couple months after the uh, transition of the government and many of our U.S. supporters, you know, friends of Kandahar Treasure who knew our work and who knew our women, they reached out to us and provided extra additional funding donations to support the women and their families because winter was coming, jobs, whatever activities that they may have been engaged with and in, aside from Kandahar Treasure, um, all of it dried up. Even Kandahar Treasure, our operation, it was ongoing, but it was difficult to see what the future of it might be um, in those critical months. And so the women um, collected donations to provide food to the women, and, and we're so grateful that we could for the 75 families that who are working with us uh, with more than 180 women. Uh, engaged with the operation, all of them got food rations for two months, December and January. And when the women received these donations, as their thank you gestures and grateful messages that they sent us, they said, we appreciate and are thankful for this help. But more than humanitarian help, we want you to support our continuous work. That to me was, I've done my job of instilling the value and the principle of working hard for your own sustenance rather than depending on the world to support you. And, and this takes me back to my dad's principle of why he refused to stay in a camp. And later on, he told us, he said, I did not want my children at that critical young age to learn to depend on others. I wanted them to learn that you work hard, you earn for yourself to sustain yourself. Unknowingly, that's what I've done with Kandahar Treasure, and then the women have learned. And I think that's probably one of the proudest moments for me to know that the women, in spite of the conditions that they're living in, they would rather work than depend on charity that the world wants to provide. Well done. How long did it actually take to get Kandahar Treasure off the ground from the idea to actually producing work that could be sold. Kandahar Treasure is in the making for more than 20 years, uh, really. And we're still learning and we're still building and we're still enhancing. But I think what happened is the first initial five years, uh, so from 2003 until 2008, when we registered the enterprise name as Kandahar Treasure, those five initial years were kind of the breeding years of confirming in my head and among the women workers, the producers, that we were serious about creating a product, producing a line of products that we could then market both nationally and internationally. So I would say to your question, about five years. Can it be shorter? Absolutely. Now in retrospect, right? Hindsight is always 2020. And so now if I had the opportunity to go back, I wouldn't wait five years to start this operation. But I was young and I was learning and there was so much going on and nobody could think what was happening with Afghanistan. So it took me and our team about five years to figure out that we no longer wanted to be a nonprofit organization's project dependent on funding sources from outside, but rather a social enterprise that would create a product or line of products sell it to sustain itself and create a brand. And for the past, um, since 2008, it's what been 14, 14 years now, we've been really just pushing the brand Kandahar Treasure to prove to the world that this is quality product, handmade by, you know, one of the most oppressed group of women in the world from a outworldly perspective, but yet women who, in spite of all the challenges that they have to live with and extreme poverty, they are able to produce some of the finest, beautiful, perfect work that we know in the industry of embroidery. So let's talk about that embroidery for a bit. Is it called kamak? Kamak. Uh, so there's a <laughs> yeah, I get that. It's hard. Yes, there. Yeah. Uh, so it's in the throat. It's hamak. And it, it, we don't know for sure what the word hamak actually means, other than the fact that for centuries we've been, women have been calling this art form uh, hamak. But ham in the Dari or word Dari Pashto language comes from raw, 
when you add the word "ak" to the end, it makes it how do I say? It, it makes it cute. So okay. "kamak," um, it makes it it doesn't belittle it, but it kind of makes it like cute. And so I think it probably has something to do with the nature of the thread. The thread that the women used to initially embroider with, which was always historically a silk thread, it was never spun. So it was just the raw, unspun thread uh, of a silk thread that they would take. And traditionally, it was white on white. So the white silk thread on a white fabric that is then geometrically woven into the fabric's weft and what, what are those weft and warp and weft warp and weft and the stitch that you make with the various different counts that you do you produce the geometric shapes based on the count and the variety of shapes and designs that these women have been able to produce is unlimited and when you compare that you know this particular work to islamic art, which is predominantly geometric shaped or geometric based, there's so much similarity. And so I'm just curious to know women who have predominantly been homebound, who didn't have access to go and explore the geometric uh, architecture of Islamic history in their community, how did they get inspired, you know, with maybe one or two sites of these mausoleums or, or great sites that they would see this Islamic art with, how did they get inspired by, by that architecture to then come and translate that into a needle and thread, which in Afghanistan, all 34 provinces of Afghanistan, the needle and thread has always been in the hands of women. Men will never touch a needle and a thread. Although when you compare us to the South Asian neighbors, Pakistan and India, some of the best embroiderers are men, whereas mm -hmm. in Afghanistan, that's never the case. So it's, it's very interesting cultural, historical understanding of what is it about Afghanistan and what has happened in Afghanistan historically that has shifted from their neighbors even the cultural context of embroidery to make it primarily and only uh, available to the hands of women. And it's the women who have been producing and passing it on for generations and generations. Well, it's interesting that we're talking about um, a segment of the population that is very poor, but yet they're sewing with silk. They, they have access to silk from the old silk route. Yes, yes, absolutely. Interesting thing also is that in the olden times, what I've learned is that the poor people were always the producers of this art because it's a very strenuous uh, work on the eyes. I mean, you need to have incredible, perfect eyesight to be able to see the warp and the weft of the fabric. But they were producing for the upper class. I probably am not surprised that the silk and the fine fabric was provided by the person who wanted this piece made. And it's a skill that was then uh, commissioned by the poor working class. However, you know, I, I mean, that's probably one case, but then I remember I, you know, my mother has told me stories of her childhood. Now they're not poor by any means. My grandfather, my mother's father was not a poor man and her uncles were not poor. Yet my mother says that she and all her cousins were raised to embroider and they never embroidered as commission work for others, but they embroidered for themselves, for their homes, for their husbands to be, or you know, brothers and fathers when they were still living at home, and then later on to their children. So my mother's last embroidery work was actually making my bed set. So I'm the fourth of five daughters, and I was expected to be a boy uh, for some crazy reason, and they were <laughs> sad to learn that I was not. But my mother has uh, embroidered her last embroidery on a blue fabric with white embroidery uh, to want to welcome her son, and her son happened to not come, and it was me instead. <laughs> <laughs> Have you seen a change in the motifs or the patterns as these women have gained more experience and they realize that they can possibly get more money for more, more intricate designs? In, that's an interesting question. It's, it, it's not so much getting more money for intricate designs. I think there's like transition of understanding the embroidery technique 
with the migration that has happened. So about 45 years ago, when Afghanistan uh, was attacked by the Russians and Afghans started to move to their neighboring countries, so Iran and Pakistan, uh, more predominantly just because of the, prox the close proximity of those countries. I don't know so much about Iran because I'm never really, haven't spent time there and I, I don't know how much of the handicraft, particularly the embroidery industry really has any space or room in Iranian society. But in Pakistan, there's a lot of embroidery, a lot of variety of embroideries uh, techniques. If we study the Kandahari hammock embroidery, so most of the people from Kandahar immigrated to Quetta, Pakistan, the Balochistan area, because that's the, the close uh, area. During this time of migration, the women take the same techniques of embroidery, but instead of focusing solely on creating shapes of geometry through geometric designs, they start making flowers, you know, like natural entities of flowers and leaves and trees. And they, they, they make these with a pen on a fabric, so, you know, draw a leaf on a fabric, but then insert the inside of the leaf with the geometric embroidery. So when you look at it, and this actually is explained in the book, when you look at the fine embroidery, it's beautiful. I mean, the geometric embroidery, is, it's, it's beautiful. But because the women did not have the skill of imprinting natural looking things like leaves and flowers and trees, you see the crooked, the very immature or amateur efforts of wanting to make it look like a flower, but it's not really a flower. And so I think what has happened, and I haven't done research to confirm this, but I think what has happened is that as they move to Pakistan and they start seeing more of the drawn in embroideries, uh, whether by machine or by hand, because those are the techniques that Pakistan and India has, the women got inspired by it. And so they started to modernize or kind of change their styles of embroidery to include that. And that happened until the early 2000s. So when I went to Afghanistan and families were still returning back from Pakistan, they would bring those types of embroideries with them where they're drawn in and then filled in with the Kandahar embroidery of Hamak. With Kandahar treasure, what we did I personally don't like that style where you draw in and then fill in because it just it, it it doesn't go with the, the with the core of what hammock is. So I started extracting and investing in old pieces. Literally, I mean, we were going home to home with these women, and I would actively ask, "Do you have an old piece of fabric that you've embroidered, or your grandmother has embroidered, or your mother has embroidered?" And they, you know, those who had it would bring out the piece. And I would ask, I said, you know, are you willing to to sell this? And a lot of the women donated it saying, why would I sell such an old piece? This is a rag. You know, we don't need it. So I started collecting and Kandahar Treasure at the moment still has a beautiful collection of these old pieces that we've gathered for almost 20 years now. And they had the old designs, the traditional designs of hammock embroidery. And I used these pieces to then commission new work. And I remember it, in the beginning when I would take this old sample with new fabric and new threads and tell the artisan to reproduce, in the beginning, they would ridicule me. They're like, oh, you're so old school. You know, this is, this is stuff that my grandmother used to do. Why are you doing this? And I, I would laugh and smile and say, you know, because this is what I like and this is what I want. And they're like, okay, you're not going to sell it, but if you like it here, we'll produce it for you. And they liked it because it's easier. You know, they don't have to do the added effort of creating or drawing objects to then fill it in. And as time passed and as they started to reproduce the old traditional designs, that inspiration and that beauty came up. And, and we saw the trend in Kandahar because men's tunics are actually hand embroidered by their women still. So um, particularly if a man, a young man is getting married, he gets at least three pieces of you know fully embroidered tunics for his the day before the wedding, the day of the wedding, and then the day after the wedding. And since more and more of these designs became the old traditional designs, there was this trend that just shifted where men no longer wanted the drawn in designs. And now if you go to Kandahar, it, even like say 10 years ago, if you wear a drawn in, you know, the style that the women picked up in Pakistan, men will ridicule other men. 
your old school. So it's it's interesting that how migration and different geographies and exposure to different things have also affected embroidery techniques. But in general, I would say that in the past 20 years, not just Kandahar treasure, but even traditionally, there has been an effort to go back to the origins and the roots of traditional designs, old designs, color schemes, because honestly, those look so much better than anything modern that we've tried to insert into this technique. Do the makers sign their work? Unfortunately, no, because these are the 99.9% maj- of the women who are embroidering do not know how to read or write. But here's a signature. It's not a silent signature. It's an invisible signature. And I've learned that this is what the women do. This work is perfect, you know, There's because it's counted and it's uh, geometrical. If you miss one stitch, like one count, it messes up the entire shape. Sometimes the best embroiderers will voluntarily make a mistake in their work as their signature to prove that they're not trying to emulate God because only God creates perfection. But each woman or each artisan has her own technique of how she wants to mess it up. So even though the women have not talked about this, I have taken it over 20 years of witnessing and watching these women, that this is their invisible signature that they insert into their art without writing or or putting a name to it because name unfortunately for Afghan women particularly women of the south we don't we don't have a name mm. I, I just even heard something recently that in Egypt young men don't don't know the names of their mother like they're not allowed to say the names of their mother they're ridiculed if they call their mother or somebody says their mother's first name and I'm going like how bizarre is that but just another way of repressing women. Absolutely. And culturally, we've been conditioned, you know, for generations to believe that saying your mother's name or your sister's name or your wife's name or your daughter's name is actually related to dishonoring them and you. And so interestingly, when my first when my father came back to Afghanistan almost four years after I'd already been there. So in 2007, he he returned to Afghanistan. And in public meetings, he would say my name because I was a public figure. I mean, I was out and about and you know, some people knew me, but my dad was told eventually by the men around him, stop saying the name of your daughter. You can say my daughter, but don't say Rangina, my daughter. And so that was an adjustment my father had a very difficult time making because he did not see anything wrong with using my name. But in that culture and in that society, women's names just don't disappear. exist. And yeah, they disappear like we physically do with all the other things that we have to go through to life, through life with life. Do you know how to do this embroidery? I think I know. <laughs> um, <laughs> I know the techniques, I know the, the you know, like if I sat, I could count, but have I actually sat down to do it in the past, say, 20 years? I would say in the first year that I was there, I attempted to do a few stitches here and there, but, you know, I've been so overwhelmed with managing it and, you know, trying to do so much other stuff that I've become lazy to actually do the art. And, and it requires, you know, the artwork, one poet slash artist slash designer slash filmmaker from India, Muzaffar Ali, who's you know a renowned filmmaker in, in in India, he looked at this embroidery for about five minutes just silently, and he just he took a, a, a magnifying glass and looked at it, and it was a full piece of embroidery. Finally, after five minutes, picks his head up and looks at me, and he says, "This is the work of worship." He says, you cannot do this work if you're not fully, you know, just kind of in depth with worshiping just this work and your creator. Because if you focus on the noise and the the, the worldly things that are happening around you, you can't focus to do this work. And, and he's right, because for me, I think in my 20 years of journey with this work and the work of Afghanistan and work with women has been that I'm craving for a moment of peace within me because it's so hard to find that moment of peaceful 
disconnection with worldly things to focus on an art so beautiful as hammock to be able to do my brain just doesn't allow me or maybe i have not allowed my brain to allow me the opportunity to just disconnect at all that level to focus on creating such fine beauty and i'm impressed i'm i'm honestly impressed with these women that in spite of all the challenges and issues and problems that they have to deal with in their life i can't even compare my problems to them they still find that connection of peace and focus and concentration where they produce such incredible fine work. So when did the idea of the book come up? The idea of the book was actually after a talk I gave to TSA, which is the, it's a conference dedicated to textile. It's a textile society of America, TSA. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just remember <laughs> They'd invited me to a conference to uh, talk about my work and the women's work um, in Los Angeles. And after I gave my talk, the audience, of course, really liked it and asked wonderful questions. And then somebody in the audience said, can you write a book? We, you know, we want to hear the story. Can you write a book? And I, my response was very abrupt. I said, I would love to, but I'm not a writer and I don't have time. And so from that audience, one of the women that I knew who was a retired professor of entrepreneurship and women's enterprises globally, Mary Littrell, who became my co-author, she then after the conference suggested, she's like, well, what if I helped you write? I still need you to dedicate your time and commitment to it, but I'll help you write it if you don't have that much time. Um, that's how the beginning of the book began. And uh, Mary and Linda uh, Ligon, who ended up printing the book, publishing the book, they actually both came to visit Kandahar uh, at a time that was very, very fragile. Um, in fact, when they were in Kandahar, they took a 10-day trip, taking the risk. We actually lost a good friend of mine killed by someone on the street as she was going to work. And so both of them witnessed the challenge of living and working in, a, in an environment, a volatile environment like Afghanistan, that it was, uh, particularly the last 10 years, more than 10 years. 2007 was really the beginning of the resurgence of violence, and it lasted until August of 2021 when the transition was finally made and the country was handed over to the Taliban. Yeah, working, working through those years now in retrospect, like when I just think back, and even now, the contradiction of creating beauty in the midst of violence and destruction and loss of life, like they're almost juxtaposing each. And yet, as I think naturally as women, we have no choice but to continue. I think this is, you know, people talk about resilience and I really see the women embroiderers embroidering as a form of resilience to things that they have no control of, over in terms of policy, governance, decrees that come out against them every day. And I think silently, as they've been living for centuries, they're continuing to produce this beauty to silently express that they're there, that they're continuing. And I know for a fact that they're hoping for a better future, but we none of us know when that better future might be. Paula Lerner, your photographer, or the, some of the photos here are by her. She had already passed by the time the book was published. Did you? How did you get permission to use her work? We lost her in 2012, right after I lost my father. Uh, so those years were very, very tough for me. But uh, she knew that I was working on this idea of a book. And before she passed, she had actually because she was a Harvard graduate and all of her beautiful work is in the Radcliffe Library. And she had written them a note saying that whenever Kandahar Treasure or Rangina Hamidi wants to use any of her work for promotion, for, for whatever purposes that I had for permission. Um, and she had left that note and I'm still in touch with her husband and her daughters and uh, the family relationship continues. And so we're so thankful and grateful that she was able to capture shots of the women, not just their work, but also of their life, you know, their life at home. Very few uh, photojournalists will practice their courage the way she did to come and stay. And, you know, I remember the times when she was there, like 
I would put a burqa on her and the poor thing would have like big cameras and backpacks with all the tools and the gadgets that she needed. And, uh, you know, on top of it, we would cover her with the burqa. And every time we would go to somebody's house, like there was this whole management aspect of it, make sure that we lock the door once we get in. Of course, we had to let the women know what we were doing, but we didn't want to take the risk of anybody walking into the home because one thing, one interesting thing about Afghanistan is the women's quarters, like the women's compounds, the women's homes are always open to other women. Men cannot walk into unknown women's homes. So if you're a man and you know, it's your neighbor's house, you can't just walk in as a man. But if you're a woman, you can be a strange woman. You could be a woman coming from halfway across the world and you walk yourself into the house, the Afghan hospitality is that the women will wel welcome you. So they love the idea of Paula coming and taking their pictures, but we didn't want to risk it by having other women see what was happening. So we would lock the door inside and then make sure to train the children who were in the house not to open the door to anybody without somebody's permission. So it was just this whole drama of managing almost like a, a movie scene everywhere we went. But I'm so glad that Paula did because all her beautiful pictures are able to show a life that not so many other people were able to uh, to bring to the world. And uh, I hope that we can have future for the journalists as brave and as committed as Paula to be able to go and continue to take uh, these beautiful pictures of people that we don't get to see regularly. It's beautiful. Like the the book is just a lovely, lovely story. And the photos of the women, joyful, working together, happy in numbers, happy within their, their group. And the pride that they show for their children and their work is just lovely. Thank you. And, and that was really both the purpose of Paula's photos also to show that sisterhood not just within Kandahar treasure, but within the bonds of women or the sisterhood bond with women, uh, no matter where we go. And the fact that, yes, things are horrible in Afghanistan and in this supplies even today. Politically, there's a lot of challenges. Economically, there's challenges. Humanitarian-wise, there's a lot of challenges. Education-wise, there's a lot of challenges. But the world needs to know that people don't stop living just because you have problems. We have problems in America, we have problems in Dubai, there's problems in every country in the world. And I think what Paula has done and what Kandahar Treasure is trying to still continuously do is to enable those opportunities of joy and happiness and togetherness and cele celebration. I was just in Kandahar uh, in January and it was cold, you know, January is a cold month and Kandahar is a desert. So it gets really, really cold in the three winter months. And the women, you know, one woman came one day with bright henna on her, you know, hand and, you know, they're celebrating. And I kind of looked at her and she just put it on the night before. And henna usually gets really, really cold at night because it, you, you wet it, right? You put wet henna on your hand. So I teased her. I said, why would you put henna in this cold on your hands and she's like oh the heck with cold you know cold comes and goes but i wanted to be happy i wanted you to see my beautiful hands with henna and she started you know embracing and laughing and enjoying and it's you know kind of treasure as as a space as a place where women gather yes they're embroidering beautiful things that we make available for people to buy but in addition to creating beauty I think what Kandahar Treasure has done is created a safe space for sisters to come, to celebrate, to laugh, to cry, to talk, to vent, and to plan and strategize. You know, we often don't give credit to women who come together, that they're actually coming together to do something good. And it might not be an immediate thing. It might not be a big thing that could be measurable because the global community and you know united nations world bank all these major organizations who work in development they love to measure everything and if it's not quantifiable in great numbers then it's not worthy my experience is it's actually these small steady but important programs and events or gatherings that actually create and leave the most impact big projects come and go and then Afghanistan is a perfect example of investing in huge projects that last only when the funding is there. And the minute the funding leaves, so does the impact of the project. 
but it's these small community level human to human engagements that remain regardless of whether funding is there or not. A lot of the women have for many years when we've not had funding to support them, they've volunteered. They've taken a pay cut. They've not taken a salary because they know that this is an important entity to maintain and to sustain. And when you have that kind of a commitment, you know that this is going to last for many generations. This is not something that will die tomorrow uh, because it might not have funding. Uh, because people are committed, people are invested, lives are invested, families are invested. And in the end, it's a joyful activity for so many of the women who have a very, very hard time finding joy um, in a very troubled world today. Now, I don't want to end this interview without asking you about your own experience in politics, I mean, you stood up and became um, the education minister for many years as you were doing this other thing. Tell us a little bit about how difficult that was and God. your successes and your disappointment, obviously. <laughs> you know, in retrospect, I think back and I ask myself the question, do I regret accepting the invitation. My response has always been consistent. I do not regret a bit of taking the challenge, an incredible challenge, in an incredible time where violence, corruption, global politics meshed, you know, merged with regional politics, with national politics, with gender politics, all of it interplaying very ugly, ugly with each other. I took the leap of faith to say yes. But I did think about it. I, I did not just jump on to the opportunity because I was completely surprised when the president asked me to join his cabinet. And the only reason I think I joined is because it was education. You know, I, I got criticized. I still get criticized by a lot of my critics to say, oh, you know, she was an embroiderer. What is she doing with the Ministry of Education? Uh, all right, fine. Not every politician necessarily has that you know, same uh, path where that they're expert in. But education, um, I said yes to because I'm blessed with a daughter and I know how important education was in my life. And I wanted to give better opportunity to my own daughter. And what I unfortunately experienced with just my daughter's experience of trying to find quality education for her, both in the government schools as well as the private schools structures, it was hard to find. It was really hard to find. And so when the president asked me, I really said, you know, I know that this is a huge challenge, but if I can do, if, you know, if I can maybe shift even 5% of the way we're doing things through the education system in Afghanistan, that would be my success. Little did I know what I was getting into because what I found once I stepped into the ministry I quickly learned that the Ministry of Education, unfortunately, I can only speak you know, for the 20 years, but now I know that this is not just a 20 year dilemma, it's been a hundred year dilemma in the country, but particularly 45 years of chaos, that the education ministry or the platform of, of education has been politicized from its inception in Afghanistan. Not so obvious the first 50, 55 years when the king uh, was still you know, running the country. But after the communist coup in 1979, education system has been inflated, in, infiltrated with politics by one regime coming after another. So whenever a political regime came, they have inserted their values and principles into the system to spread and push their agenda. And, and we see it to this day. Three of my accomplishments in a very short time that I was there as a woman who had many, many critics then and still do to this day, even though I'm no longer a minister, is that I first restructured the structure of the ministry. So we had five deputies, a minister, and then a planning department. And from my short assessment, what I realized is that there were seven ministries within a ministry. Each of those uh, hierarchy position was working in silo on his or her own without you know, this entity called Ministry of Education coming together to work for one vision and one mission. 
So I tried to create a structure and I succeeded in restructuring it to make it all so that there's checks and balances and so that this this entity, this administration would work with one vision. Number two, I drafted with the help of my Afghan colleagues. We did not spend a single penny of aid money, grant money, or the Afghan government money, but this was something of a passion where me and my Afghan colleagues within the ministry drafted the very first national education policy for five and 10 years after 20, you know, 21. Unfortunately, the day of the fall on August 20, 15, 2021, which also happens to be my birthday, that national education policy, the final draft was on my desk. I signed it with the hope of sending it to the president for a final approval so that we could publicize it. Unfortunately, that didn't happen. And thirdly, I think I'm proud to say that I stayed and remained committed to making the student, the school, and the teacher my priority and not various political stakeholders the priority as my predecessors have done. That was the probably the, the hardest challenge because when you have a politicized structure and a politicized system, everybody expects you to do things for them. And when you are a woman and you're not liked and you're, you don't have political backing other than sole president supporting you, and you're not interested in building a political career, you just want to help the children of Afghanistan through the education system, you can imagine how difficult it was every day in and out to say no to the people who were used to hearing yes and to focus more on the children and the teachers and the schools to at least bring us to the capacity of not necessarily competing with the global community, but at least be able to have our students compete, not, you know, compete their knowledge at the regional level. And I wish we had more time to do it. Unfortunately, everything flipped so quickly that we didn't, it, it's, it's all unfinished business and there's still dreams and desires of hoping that I wish I had the time to do more, but some things are never in, in your control. I'm sure your life was threatened many, many times. And I'm surprised to hear that you actually went back to Kabul with um, that kind of danger. My life was threatened not by the Taliban. I think when I was minister, of course, I had to be careful. I was moving around in a completely bulletproof vehicle with security guards ahead of me, security guards behind me. And you know, we, ha we had to take all those measurements for security protocols in place. But I never for once even feared that I would be targeted as Rangina Hamidi, the Minister of Education. I thought that maybe I could either become collateral damage in another attack, you know, collective attack, and or if I was going to be attacked, I was going to be attacked on my position, not as Rangina. It would be attacking the Minister of Education as a government entity. But quite honestly, Karen, I got threats by parliamentarians who were members of the democratic institution that we had built. I was threatened by political elites who were not happy with what I was trying to do with the Ministry of Education, not only threatened, but completely disregarded. And yet I never felt, even after the fall, while many of my colleagues were scared and continue to be scared that, you know, you work with the government, and of course, you're going to become a target for the new regime. I never feared that because my response always was, what have I done wrong? And maybe it's a naive way of thinking. But again, I think this is part of the thinking of a non-political politician. I I was not on a political track record. You know, I was not a, a track record politician to say, well, I have to do this to please this. I only went because I thought I could serve and I served in the best possible way that I could without pleasing one entity over another. And I was also very happy that I opened the doors of my ministry to communities and to people who had been neglected for almost all of the 20 years of the democratic uh, you know, republic. People came to visit me in my office from corners of Afghanistan 
who had never even dreamed of being able to come to the ministry. And so I think that level of the connection that I created with people also spread the information or spread the news that this minister is different. And I'm not saying I'm better or worse, but I was different. And so that kind of gave me the confidence that I won't be targeted. And so when I decided to go back after my first initial, you know, we evacuated because of my daughter. My daughter was 11. And I was scared because the news, you know, frenzy around Afghanistan and the whole you know, world shutting its doors on Afghanistan on August 31st. And then if you're stuck there, you're stuck there and you're not going to be able to get out. And, you know, as a mother, of course, I got scared. I said, what if this really does happen? Um, so I left. But then I decided to go back that same December 2022. I've since taken three trips. And every time I go, this last time I went all by myself, not with my husband. And to my surprise, every time I go, I've not been bothered. I've not been asked. I don't feel like I'm followed. I just have a different experience than so many other people. And I have no idea why. Uh, I mean, I know why. <laughs> I know why. But I think people can make their own uh, conclusions about it. But I'm a believer. You know, I'm not going to be stupid. I think I know what to do and what not to do where. But I also believe that if you're passionate about something in life and you believe in it, you shouldn't let fear stop you from it. And as my dad used to say, I don't want to be a martyr. I'm not saying that I'm asking to be martyred for what I do and what I believe in. But three days before his death, he has made an interview and he, in his television interview, he says, you know, I'm an old man. I'm going to die one day of if he had diabetes, diabetes or cancer or any other disease. So I'm not afraid of dying. I might as well die doing what I believe and what I care about rather than die of sickness of old age in bed. And so keeping that in the back of my head also makes me continue to take this risk and this challenge that why am I allowing fear to control me? Of course, I won't be stupid. I won't go and walk into a fire. But if I take the precautionary measures ahead of time to be able to go and take a little bit of risk to do what I still believe in, I leave the rest to the higher powers because I'm a believer that if I'm not doing anything wrong, I won't see anything wrong. So if people want to learn more about Kandahar Treasures, how do they find out more? So we do have a website, um, kandahartreasure.com. Luckily, we just got our 501c3 uh, nonprofit status in the United States. So if anybody's interested in supporting us through a donation, in-kind donation or financial donation, they're able to with getting a tax benefit. Uh, but we're primarily at the moment uh, fundraising for getting a permanent space for the women in Kandahar. Uh, we've been renting the facility for more than 20 years now, and we can continue to. It's not that renting is not an option. But I would like to challenge us, myself and our supporters to make a permanent mark uh, for Kandahar Treasure and its um, you know, hundreds of artisans and their daughters to gift them a permanent location that they can call their own. I think making that statement, particularly right now, is much more impactful than it was in the past or that it might be in the future. So if anybody wants to support us in that capacity, um, the information is on the website. Uh, in addition, purchasing our book through Amazon, it is available on Amazon, Embroidering Within Boundaries. It spreads the story, it spreads the, the work, it educates people about what these incredible women have been doing and continue to do. The more people who know us, the more people will support us. And then finally, we are working on a, a direct retail shop to be available online pretty soon. Sign up on our website for uh, our newsletter, and we will inform you when that live store comes up so that you can purchase your gifts, your holiday items, your birthday celebrations, Mother Day celebrations, whatever you want, our beautiful gifts, our heirloom pieces that you can pass on to lots of your friends and family members. And if anybody is interested, we do have at the moment a location in Virginia, which is my sister's home. Uh, my sister has graciously 
uh, offered her time and services to help Kandahar Treasure, and she carries our products in her basement in Sterling, Virginia. So if anybody's in the Virginia area or in that area and you're interested in wanting to go see Kandahar Treasure products, they're available there. So I think I've given many options of how you can connect with us and support us if you would like. Well, thank you so much for your time. I've loved talking to you. You are so inspiring. And I hope one day we'll get to meet in person. Thank you. I look forward to that. And I will extend that to say, I hope we can meet in person in Kandahar one day. I hope you enjoyed my interview with Rangina Hamidi. Her bravery and dedication to raising the living standards for these women is nothing less than heroic. If you would like to support Kandahar Treasure by making a donation to their building fund, I will leave a link to their website in the video notes below. If you would like to purchase a copy of Embroidering Within Borders, I will leave a link below to that as well. Next time you're in your sewing room, be sure to have Karen's Quilt Circle playing in the background. I have interviewed so many interesting, wonderful, and inspiring people on this show. Let one inspire you. Take care, and I'll see you next time.